Live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. And yeah, I'm your host, Ben Crossman. Hopefully everyone out there having a wonderful day and uh, ready for some Computer America. So today on the agenda, we have CES Day 2 coverage and, uh, you know, pretty late news day. I think we only have about 25 different things to talk about. So uh, not going to get to them all. We are going to try to you know, do our best, manage our, t- manage our time well. And uh, yeah, in the meantime, hey, we'll just have fun with it. So everyone, welcome into the Computer America show. Uh, let's see. So before we get started, ComputerAmerica.com, that will have everything, including the show notes, uh, contest, live video feed, er- everything and anything that you need can be found at our website. Also, while you're there, be sure to uh, you know check out any articles, reviews, things like that that we post up. And uh, on top of that, if you want to you know interact with us with our chat room, feel free Twitch.tv forward slash Computer America. So. All that being said, why don't we go ahead and uh, and just get things started here. So obviously, like I said, the whole day is dedicated to uh, computer technology news with a focus primarily on CES, and we'll probably do this uh, tomorrow as well because CES has so much to talk about. We won't be able to, of course, hit it all, but there's so much we can, of course, dedicate a couple of days to this. So everyone, uh, welcome. Here we go. Computer and Technology News brought to you by Computer America. So why don't we start out today with, um, you know, and yeah, let's start out today with some controversy because that's always fun. This is the one currently ripping through uh, social media sites and what have you, and it hits on a subject that seems to pop up again and again because the core issue is not going to go away, well, anytime soon. And this has to do, of course, with uh, uh, sexism and gender bias at CES. And really, you can uh, you know, really parlay that into biases that happen, oh, I don't know, across technology. Whether it's through, uh, you know, the the educational field, through you know, through high school, how early they get into it, the gender bias in video games, things like that. Uh, obviously, it, it's been a male-dominated area for a long, long time. There's no getting around that, and things don't turn on a dime. Uh, CES made some concessions, I think, this year, where uh, or uh, maybe not concessions. They made some real effort. That uh, they where 2017, 2018, 
uh, every keynote speaker at CES was male, you know, 100% men, 0% women. This year, they really went out of their way to make sure that it was 50-50. Uh, you know, tech CEOs, trust me, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of very uh, intelligent women, part of some great organizations that could speak at events like these. It's just, if you don't make it a priority, uh, you know, it's kind of the status quo will remain, and it's just going to continue to be male-dominated. So little things like that. And that brings us to today's article. And, you know, uh, this hits on things that we talked about, but uh, this has to do with, um, and, and, and really, I, I like to think that a lot of people will come and down, you know, very, uh, very logically on this, where, yes, there are these problems I was just talking about, but at the same time, uh, some of the assertions by, uh, you know, by this article and, of course, by the uh, by the CEO that is making these claims, well, they're a little uh, disingenuous. So, everyone, here we go. Uh, I promise uh, any hate mail, feel free to send it, but uh, we're going to try to be as neutral on this as we can. And warning, I guess, mature content. Um, you know, we are going to be talking about a, a hidden driver in technology, and that is in the... Uh, sexual gratification area where you are talking about and really this article at the heart of it is talking about well uh pleasure devices and so what happened was there was and, and this is uh by the way this is uh, coming directly from a newswire pr newswire and this is an open letter from laura de carlo and she says that her sex toy won a CES Robotics Innovation Award, and then they took it back. So her device obviously was, um, you know, well-made enough, innovative enough that it had won an Innovation Award at CES. And trust me, those awards they're uh, they're very prestigious. Uh, they they do go out to some very interest, uh, very interesting and new products. And I guess this open letter is you know, kind of where we start. Uh, this is, uh, let's see. So obviously this was provided by Laura DiCarlo, the, you know, the one who was uh, stiffed at the, um, maybe that's not the right word for this kind of article. She was the one who was, uh, you know, had the award taken away from her. So every, so she says that uh, everything that we do at Laura DiCarlo is rooted in, of course, inclusion. And so they don't have what they do. And, you know, we already went over what they, you know, the product that they showed off. And, you know, uh, her point is that they need to drop the tabooedness or if that's even a word, uh, they need to drop the taboo around, well, sex. And for that part, she felt that she was uh, unfairly treated by the runners of CES or, you know, the people who put on CES and said that she won, uh, they won the 20, CES 2019 Innovation Award honoree in the robotics and drone product category for the Ose personal massager and saying that it was vetted by the Consumer Te uh, Technology Association, CTA, who owns and produces CES and CTA is a very, uh, you know, is a very reputable organization. So CTA said that, hey, this is good stuff. And then the panel of independent expert judges in robotics scored it highly across judging criteria. They saw the same marvel of cutting edge technology that we did, a product that pushes the limits of engineering and design and opens the door to even bigger leaps in innovation. And uh, really, obviously, if something is well made, regardless of its, uh, of its purpose, it can still be innovative in its field. It can still be something different in what it can do. Now, here's the thing. Uh, they took the award away from her, and this is the problem. Where CTA has been extremely cagey on why they took away the award, their first excuse was to cite the rule buried in their legalese, and that rule, by the way, direct quote, entries deemed by CTA in their sole discretion to be immoral, obscene, indecent, profane, or not keeping with CTA's image will be disqualified. Uh, CTA reserves the right in its sole discretion to disqualify any entry at any time, which in CTA's opinion, so obviously this is completely up to their discretion, endangers the safety or well-being of any person or fails to comply with these official rules. So... Here's the thing, and, and then and then the article gets in, gets into the point that uh, that I kind of take exception with, which is CTA as as an organization, I 
think that they're trying to, with CES, take... Uh, I, I don't want to say take the high road because, you know, what... Uh, you know what this company is doing with the product that they released. It's not a bad thing uh, This has been an undercurrent in technology for a while and some of these that they pointed out uh, they had uh, you know an entire uh, Entire I, I just call it a, a doll the entire dolls launch on the CES show floor they have had, uh, you know, some of the other examples that they point out, other, you know, other toys that were aimed at men were, of course, shown off at CES. Uh, even on the showroom floor, they had VR uh, games that were adult-oriented, and the games were, of course, played on the show floor in front of the public uh, with people walking by, watching people watch VR, uh, well, watching VR porn. It's... And and at the same time, like I get that that happened. I think that the show floor is so big, so massive, so many companies can come in. And while I think that there's a time and a place for everything, uh, those are the exception. Those are not the rule. It's not like there's an entire wing of the Las Vegas uh, Convention Center completely dominated to the male fantasy. Uh, and also, on top of that, neither of these were awarded... Uh, any kind of award, special recognition, CES uh, innovation award, none of these were awarded. Uh, you know what this award is, and you know this might have slipped through the cracks. Someone might have t- taken exception to this after the fact. Uh, higher ups, as they said, they had complete uh, discretion to do this whenever they want. Uh, really, if anything, it tarnishes uh, the brand of CTA to kind of say that hey, this is. Uh, yeah, in, in anywhere that you land on this, if you think this is the right call, the wrong call, hey, you're going to go for or against CTA on this. But the point I'm trying to make is that it's not out of the ordinary. They, uh, you know, they have actually taken a pretty hardline stance against a lot of uh, adult content. They want CES to be something where you go to see drones, where you go to see toys, where you go to see... Um, you know, uh, computer monitors, TVs, like there's, um, and, and of course the article gets, gets into gender bias, uh, gets into double standard when it comes to sexuality and sexual health. Uh, the article gets into, uh, you know, how this is completely against women, how CES is stifling innovation. Uh, yeah. And, you know, even a call to action against this, um, what, and, and and I guess my final thoughts on this are what they're doing and the, you know in the award that they won, what they're doing is not wrong. I have seen other products like this. I went out to CES myself. I saw products like these on display. This is not the first time one of these uh, you know, one of these devices has been on display at CES. There have been plenty. There have been a lot, and just this time one of them won a CES Innovation Award. That award was taken away because of the nature of the product, but at the same time, the the inverse, the 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 male core, you know, corollary, was not awarded. It's not like they took it away from a female pleasure device and gave it to a male pleasure device. No, they just said, you know, that's a bit too high profile for something like this. Um, it's completely within CTA's uh, purview to say that you know. We like CES and we like your products. You can keep displaying on the showroom floor as you always have been able to. It's just up on stage, you know, given a lot more spotlight because the CES 2019 Innovation Award, um, or at least, I'm sorry, or at least an honoree, uh, that does give you a bit more uh, notoriety. And they're not saying it's a bad product. They're not saying that they don't, that this doesn't deserve it. It's just, it's the wrong category. Uh, that's the feeling that I got from CTA. So yes, there are issues for, uh, with technology when it comes to gender biases and things like that. And they're working on it. There have been a lot of initiatives by a lot of companies. Uh, there's been a lot of public out, you know, uh, speaking out about this, but is this the hill to stand on and say CES as an organization, CTA as an organization are, you know, completely destroying women's chances at, uh, you know, at pleasure and at, uh, you know, innovating within the tech field. I don't think so. 
So that's the one that, uh, you know, of, of course comes up. And the article itself, uh, you know, gets into a lot more that really just is not in the purview of, of Computer America, uh, talking about booth babes and things like that. But hey, you know, it's, um, it's an evolving culture. And like I said, it doesn't happen overnight. And there's certainly a lot to be said for, uh, you know, making people aware of this kind of thing. But at the same time, this seems to be, um, I, I, I don't know, Bl- blaming the organization for something that it really didn't do. I mean, yeah. So there are, there are my completely all over the place thoughts about it, but that seemed like a big enough issue. And I know it's a sensitive enough topic, but I wanted to, of course, address it. So with, uh, let's see, with that being said, why don't we go ahead and let me see, let me see. So yeah, let's go ahead, get started with uh, our next one. Hopefully this one a little bit less inflammatory. Uh, let us discuss, and again, today we're, we're primarily focused on CES uh, 2019, you know, what's coming out of there. Let's talk about <laughs> AMD. AMD has some pretty good announcements and always want to give credit where credit is due. Where, let's see, let's talk about this one first. So these two articles that I have here, they're actually tied in with one another during AMD's, of course, uh, uh, keynote that they gave out at CES. And I think they're both, you know, hey, fairly cool. So the first one, we'll do this one, AMD Radeon 7. If my Roman numerals are correct, AMD Radeon 7 is the first 7 nanometer GPU for gamers. And that's the important part. 7 nanometer. That is the size of the die used to cast the processors for uh, the graphics card. And that is super important for Everything from the amount of transistors you can actually fit onto the device itself, the small the nanometer. Uh, for a long time there, we were working with 14, 10, and now we uh, AMD is really the one showing off 7. And the fact that you can fit more transistors, you can get more power out of it, it's more energy efficient because it's you know uh, more for less. And in general, it's just a really good thing. Like if, if you're looking for the speed increases you're hoping for generation over generation, you are really looking for that reduction in size. Now, AMD is making a, stat, a big stab at 4K gaming with its new high-end video card, Radeon 7. Radeon, I'll be honest, uh, their naming scheme has always kind of eluded me. But pretty simple this one, Radeon 7, I'm sure 7 indicates 7 nanometer. They said that it's notable for being the world's first consumer 7 nanometer GPU. And I think that's the qualifying part there where uh, Radeon itself had made a 7 7 nanometer GPU. Um, Oh, They made one, I want to say, back in November of this year. So they've certainly done something like this before. Um, yeah, and yeah, so they've certainly done something like this before, but they were selling it to organizations, supercomputers, uh, places that need a, needed a lot of number crunching and throughput where this is the first one aimed at, hey, the consumer. So really the primary difference there is, uh, you know, kind of how they're designed, first of all, and second of all, the price point, you know, we didn't even know the price of those things, but this one, uh, I'm sure is going to be somewhere in the here we go, the uh, $700 range, just skipping ahead in the article. Uh, Yeah, so again, AMD uh, 7 nanometer Instinct GPUs, which were built for computational professionals, what I was just talking about, not gamers. The new GPU looks like a significant bump beyond the Vega 64 and 56, which were powerful when they launched in 2017, but have since blown away by NVIDIA's RTX GPUs. So NVIDIA does not use the seven nanometer architecture. Uh, They're just um, kind of more expensive, beefier uh, GPUs. But um, yeah, this is going to start giving the the 20 series a run for their money. So with, uh, with that being said, why don't we go ahead and 
Yeah, so I want to go ahead and talk about uh, the new GPU features 60 compute units running at speeds up to 1.8 gigahertz, as well as 16 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory. Uh, during her CES note, AMD CEO Lisa Su showed off the GPU playing Devil May Cry, uh, Devil May Cry 5 in 4K at over uh, 60 FPS. And 60 FPS, that's... Um, that's almost mandatory at high-end gaming at this point. If you want a good-looking game, it has to be over 60 FPS. Not even locked, but over. Uh, the gameplay looked pretty fluid, and you didn't notice any slowdown. This is obviously the reporter from Engadget uh, was at the event itself. So while it's great to have native 4K rendering past 60 frames, personally, he says he's more intrigued by the visual upgrade and more natural lighting, reflections, and shadows which ray tracing delivers. Ray tracing, again, if you aren't paying attention, that is what allows objects to interact with one another uh, in terms of lighting. So if you have a light bulb and it's off to the left of the object, the shadow that is displayed and the lighting that hits the object will orient itself based on where the light source is coming from. More natural, more fluid, uh, something that used to, be, uh, used to only be in pre-rendered cutscenes is now in real time. That's the important part. Now, uh, let's see. So the Radeon, uh, yeah, Radeon 7 will be available February 7th. Right? Something about 7s uh, for about $700. The Radeon 7 will be available February 7th for $700, 777. And as a bonus, you will get Devil May Cry 5, Resident Evil 2, and The Division 2 in the box. All great games. And... Uh, yeah, so they said that uh, it's nice to see AMD trying to push the high-end gaming even more, but it's still lagging behind NVIDIA. And I think that's the important part where AMD has never, or I, I can't say never, but AMD for the past decade or so has never been in the business of outperforming NVIDIA. That's not why you buy AMD. You buy AMD because... Uh, in uh, an NVIDIA 2080 Ti, which, uh, let's see, NVIDIA 2080 Ti, let's do some guerrilla research here, town uh, over shopping, about $1,200, $1,300, depending on where you buy it from, it can, be, it can be more, it can be less, but directly from NVIDIA, uh, you're looking at about $1,200. Uh, if the AMD 7 says it can do what it promises to do, it's probably going to be on the same uh, scale as let's say a 2080 or maybe even a 2070 but it's going to be a couple it's going to be a couple hundred dollars cheaper that's the important part so they said that uh, and, and of course it you know everything from 30 percent less power uh, in increased performance you buy AMD because you're saving a bit of money, but you're getting a comparable experience. You may not get the best experience as if you went with uh, the best of, of NVIDIA, but you're getting a comparable one. So there you have it. Now, uh, there's that one. And then, of course, there is actually, wow, did I skip ahead? All right, yeah. So let's go ahead and skip over to this other article. It's the same uh, keynote, so don't need to go over a lot, but... Here we go. Speaking of 7 nanometer, uh, we just talked about their 7 nanometer uh, GPUs. Now we get to talk about the 7 nanometer CPUs. And CPU, that's super important, where you are talking about, um, oh, how do you say it? You're talking about um, processors, and that's going to make a big difference because this is somewhere that Intel seems to be stymied. Uh, Intel has, I think, announced the first 10 nanometer, but for AMD to be able to come out and say that, hey, we have seven, seven nanometer, that is a huge, uh, that is huge news. So AMD announced that its much anticipated seven nanometer third generation Ryzen 3 chips will start shipping in mid 2019. So just a couple of months and talked about some of the benefits of the new design. They said that they ran a live Cinebench test at stock frequencies against Intel's latest Core i9-9900K. And the Core i9-9900K, uh, that is the most, or one of the most hyper-threaded and highest performing uh, CPUs when it comes to uh, Intel's lineup. 
And they said they ran those benchmarks to show that it would draw about 30% less power while edging it out in performance just barely. Saying that now you really see the power of 7 nanometer technology and what being aggressive with technology does. A little, uh, you know, little coy there. So to be fair, the i9-9900K is one of Intel's most powerful and power-hungry desktop chips, and AMD's chips have yet to ship. That's, that's true, because you can actually go out and buy an i9-9900K, whereas AMD, hey, a couple months away. So even if you're a couple months behind, uh, the really important part here is, again, the 7 nanometer design. That's going to make it much more efficient when it comes to power consumption. And you're wondering, why does that matter for a gaming CPU? Most gaming CPUs are uh, notoriously power hungry. They're within desktop cases with incredible cooling because they run at higher temperatures. And really, that's the point. If you can squeeze uh, you know, the Ryzen 3 chip, which is comparable to an i9-9900K, but it uses 30% less energy, First of all, battery life. Your laptop is going to perform very, very well and last longer. That's great. And then the second part is heat management. Less energy used, less heat generated, and less uh, you know, less cooling that CPU will need. This is going to be great for gaming laptops. This is also going to be great for uh, people who like to overclock because if your chip is running at a safe temperature, and you know, just because it's seven nanometer using less using less electricity, uh, it is generating less heat. That means that you can overclock it even more to what you consider safe levels and get even more performance out of these chips. Now, she said she said that uh, Sue also showed the chip itself and discussed how it's different than any other AMD chip you've seen before. And if you're watching the video portion, you can see the processor here, two little uh, black squares for the processor on a single uh, chip is pretty cool. Saying that it consists of a larger and smaller die with the smaller die actually containing the eighth, uh, I'm sorry, the eight seven nanometer cores with 16 threads and the larger die being the input output module. And that allowed the company to make the chip compatible with current AM4 motherboards. So to upgrade, you'll just need to swap out the chip. And really, that's that's also no, another important part where with these changes in architecture, you can see that uh, the processor itself is even smaller. You could theoretically uh, completely change the chip size itself and make it smaller itself and so on and so forth. But hey, you know, AMD knows that uh, not everyone is going to want to go out and buy a whole new motherboard and buy all new, uh, you know, every other piece of your computer, if you change the if you change the size of the chip and made it incompatible, that means that uh, you would cut off a huge part of your market that is simply looking to upgrade. So another smart move there by uh, AMD. So obviously a couple things here. Uh, we don't have a lot of, um, we don't have, oh, that noise was me checking out the uh, uh, the keynote. So we don't have a lot of uh, true specs. We don't have any number of cores. We don't have any kind of speed. Uh, you know, uh, the benchmarks that they ran are most likely cherry picked. Everyone in the industry does it. When you are trying to make your product look as best as it can, AMD is undoubtedly going to play to its strengths. AMD is very good at multi th or hyper threading, multi core processing. So they probably chose a lot of uh, games and a lot of uh, you know program systems, whatever. A lot of benchmarks that show off what it's kind of designed for. Whereas you know things like maybe individual core speed would probably still go over to Intel. So that's why real world out of the hands of AMD or Intel or anyone else, whenever you see benchmarks, you have to kind of take into account the source of them. You have to find a trusted, reliable uh, provider of benchmarks and don't take AMD or Intel's word uh, for the benchmarks themselves. But it's exciting. Seven nanometer technology is really something of the future and it's nice to see AMD able to br you know, bring that. So with that being said, I think we have time to just announce really our next one. And then after the break, we'll get into the rest uh, a, a lot more. 
why don't we talk about more hardware? This is really cool. And this is something that I'm hearing, you know, reading all these articles, seeing the reporting coming out of CES, and something that I'm, I've really picked up on. Monitors and TVs are king this year. So that's why it was pretty, pretty darn cool to see LG's 49-inch ultra-wide monitor. That's right. And if you're watching the video portion, you can see a picture here. If you're not, let me describe it to you. Uh, it's wide. It is incredibly wide. Let's see uh, real quick before the break, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, all the specs and things like that. But just to give you an idea, you know, because let's say your traditional monitor will be, you know, uh, things like uh, a one-to-one -one will be a square, and uh, a traditional monitor would wide screen would be like 21 by nine. This puppy is 32 by nine. It is incredibly wide. So everyone, music means we'll take a break. We'll be right back. More Computer America right after this. Stay tuned. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare. What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? low-cost airlines with one call to low-cost airlines you'll drastically slash your travel costs we're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations where would you like to go london rome costa rica australia wow that's cheap so why wait call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the u.s or international our prices are so low we can't publish them the only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airline travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is uh, 32 minutes past the hour as we continue on here. And yeah, uh, for anyone out there who's missed the first part of the show, uh, no guests, computer technology news. We are dedicating the entire hour to the news coming out of CES. It's a big, 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 big trade show. And, uh, you know, even all even all the articles that, uh, you know, that we kind of picked out mainly focus on hardware that we wanted to cover, uh, we're not going to be able to get to. So everything CES, if you miss any part of today's show, check us out wherever podcasts are heard, punch in Computer America, and we should pop right up. If not, ComputerAmerica.com. We have a full directory. Check it out there. Uh, also available on YouTube and things like that. So now, getting back to the story that we were just about to do, we, of course, have none other than, let's see, let's see, there we go. So, yeah, none other than LG and their incredible 49-inch ultra-wide monitor. This thing's crazy. So, they said that uh, the rollable L uh, OLED TV, which we talked about on Monday, uh, from LG may have stolen the show at CES 2019, but the company's got a slew of other interesting products up its sleeve where now we are looking at the LG and going to throw a code name at you, LG49WL95C. There you go. 
It's a 49 inch. 49 inch. That's incredibly wide. Uh, ultra wide monitor, aspect ratio 32 by 9, with a dual QHD display and, and two built in 10 watt stereo speakers with rich bass. I'm sure it's a rich bass, but I like bass. Uh, the super wide, uh, the super wide and high res screen also features support for HDR10, USB Type C, and adjustable stand that lets you swivel it, tilt it, and tweak its height. Uh, pretty darn cool. And you know, just just looking at this thing, uh, yeah. It, if you have to have one monitor on your desk, and you know, you're one of those people who's just like, I have to have just one. Uh, this is probably going to be it for you. Meanwhile, for gamers, LG is showing off its latest 27 and 37 inch Ultra Gear gaming monitors, which uh, they also have here respectively. They both come in QHD Nano IPS displays, 144 hertz refresh rate, and of course, G-Sync. Uh, yeah, so you know, uh, really, if nothing else, this is LG showing off that it's um, it's trying things. And I don't know if we are going to look back in five years and say, wow, remember the ultra wides and how goofy those things were? Uh, I, I think multi-monitor displays are not goofy whatsoever. And so it makes sense to have one screen do the job that two would normally do. But it looks pretty cool. It, it, it um, certainly serves a purpose. I'm not sure if one continuous screen is going to beat out individual screens but LG is trying it and that is hmm, that is really the cool part to see so good job LG keep up the innovation uh, rollable TV now ultra wide things like that really really cool so there you have it uh, okay so from that one why don't we go ahead and move over See, we have a compilation article. Let's see if there's any other articles we want to get to about CES before we do that. Um, <laughs> let us. All right. So we talked about AMD. We can talk about Intel real quick. And Intel, they announced their first 10 nanometer ice lake processors. And this is the moment that we have been waiting for. Well, not seven nanometer like AMD is touting. 10 nanometer is the next iteration that Intel was gunning for because they've been on 14 nanometer for so long. It's about time that they switched things up and went to 10 and they have cited that the delay has been everything from, uh, well actually have been primarily just the fact that it's really, really hard to shrink these things down anymore. Uh, yeah. So Intel isn't messing around where CES 2019, uh, the CS2019 keynote introduced Ice Lake, by the way, if you're looking for, you know, uh, the name of the thing is called Ice Lake. And the very first series of his processors to be built upon the 10 nanometer Sunny Cove architecture. So the company didn't just announce with, uh, uh, didn't just announce the chip was coming. It showed an actual piece of silicon and it uh, ended powering a laptop with performance testing. The company claimed that Ice Lake chips can search for images two times faster than even a modern laptop. Why that matters? So that's a weird metric to give people, you know, search for images two times faster. Uh, that is important for every company out there that has hundreds and thousands of these processors so that they can... Uh, you know, really run the internet. You're looking at your Googles and you are looking at your Amazons and what have you. Everyone who relies on a number of these things working together, working quickly, being efficient. Uh, yeah, they're all now chomping at the bit, you know, saying that every one of these processors can now do a simple task like, you know, retrieving X amount of data twice as fast. Yeah, that's going to speed up their back end infinitely. Or at least two times. So Ice Lake will also be the first chip to come with built, uh, built in Thunderbolt 3 integration, Wi-Fi connectivity, and Gen 2 graphics, saying the, the last of which is capable of powering a 4K display. That's pretty interesting. You know, taking some of the uh, dedication or taking some of the uh, 
you know, what used to be its own discrete dedicated devices and squeezing it onto the same chip so that you, you could get Wi-Fi and power a display and power a peripheral, i.e. Thunderbolt 3, uh, and power a peripheral, uh, although Thunderbolt is mainly used for data transfer rates, so for hard drives. The fact that you could hook up a hard drive, uh, Wi-Fi integration, and a display directly from the processor uh, motherboards should really, you know, kind of look at that and go, uh oh, because if you can start, uh, you know, put these things with, uh, you know, directly onto the chip, the role of the motherboard is going to start to wane, especially in some of these more, uh, integrated devices. So Intel also demonstrated how users will be able to play with its amped up Gen 2 uh, integrated graphics. Unfortunately, Intel didn't disclose any settings that they were playing games at. Where if you look at in the past uh, Intel discrete graphics, they've been pretty um, pretty lackluster. So I'm interested. I'm interested to see just what Intel has cooked up here. Because, you know, going in, zero expectations for that actually being good. But, I digress. Uh, they said that Intel has also announced Project uh, Athena. There you go. It's ambitious program to push mobile computing to its next era. In its mission, the chipmaker plans to work with hardware manufacturers to develop thinner and lighter products to recapture the thunder that birthed Ultrabooks. Where if you look at Ultrabooks and where they kind of came from a couple of years ago, and you look at the technology that is possible today, thanks to things like flexible displays, uh, you know, we saw the bendable phone out there at CES. So things like uh, flexible displays, uh, more system integration on chip, uh, you look at just everything slimming down. As thin as Ultrabooks were, you can have even thinner technology today and even more durable technology. That's also another important part. So definitely important for Intel to, you know, push the envelope when it comes to that. Uh, let's see. They also have things like hybrid platforms and, uh, let's just go ahead and close that. So yeah, uh, hybrid platforms where they announced the new Foveros, Favoros technology. There you go. Uh, let's see. So they said that they would allow to create processors that would pair diff uh, different types of processor cores into the same chip for more rounded CPU. Today, we're finally seeing the fruits of this with a new technology in the form of Lakefield chip. Uh, Lakefield is closer to the processor that power your phone in that they pair big performance focused CPUs with smaller low energy CPUs. Makes sense. Uh, what that means I'm sure to demonstrate this development, Intel, here we go over right here in the article, pulled out a motherboard uh, fitted with Lakefield processor no larger than a Roku stick. Uh, they said that uh, Intel showed off, uh, showed off includes a single 10 nanometer Sony Cove core and four additional Atom cores. What that means is that you can then start to, like, I don't know if this is going to be like uh, per application basis or if you have to be one of these large companies to order uh, 10,000 units of these. But if you have a very specific task in mind where if you just need like one big beefy core to run your, you know, whatever operating system you're, you're, you are using and then you need, I don't know, maybe 20 mobile or Atom cores as they call them, 20 cores to better take advantage of a lot of you know, lightweight processes, it seems like Intel is going to be able to do that for you. And that has really a lot of implications where it's not just, hey, how do we design this hard, you know, this software to best run on existing hardware? It's, okay, what is actually the best for this process? What is the best for this technology? And then we can design the processor around that. And that can, you know, really make a difference in certain applications. So, with uh, with that being said, uh, uh, again, just Intel um, always have big announcements, and I think this is a very very good one. Even though they did not come out with seven nanometer like AMD did, this is still a very strong showing from Intel, which is what we like to see. So there you go, ten nanometer. Finally, 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 finally in people's hands. Uh, yeah, and I think they said those will be available in the coming months. So 
definitely check that out. Okay, in the meantime, let's see, we have other articles here, and I have this one here, uh, again, it's kind of a, a compilation article, it's going to take up a bit of time, let's see if there's any other articles that we really wanted to get to. If you're just joining us, by the way, uh, today's show entirely dedicated to CES Day 2, and uh, yeah, hey, we're, uh, we're just plowing through it. Let's talk about, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay, how about this one? Uh, Hyundai. Hyundai. Uh, yeah, I know it's Hyundai. Uh, 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 Hyundai. They have developed a car, and this seems to be catching a lot of people's imaginations uh, simply because it's so weird and almost impractical. So check this out. This is uh, something for, I don't know if this is going to be for... Uh, emergency services, or if everyone is maybe one day going to be driving with these things, but it's just goofy. If you're watching the video portion, you can see a picture, a concept of what they're thinking, but reaching emergencies in time to save lives isn't always a matter of sheer power. Sometimes tough terrain means that even the most capable wheeled vehicle simply can't get through. Because, hey, you know, regardless of how big your engine is, a wheel's a wheel. And a car is designed like a car. Until, I guess, at CES 2019, Hyundai showed off a new concept vehicle that could make it easier to reach victims of natural disaster. And they call it a walking car, which uses articulated legs to navigate off-road f- <laughs> to navigate off-road following floods, fires, and earthquakes. Because, you know, you think of roads and you think of cars, they need a you know, relatively flat level, uh, consistent surface. And after a natural disaster, like let's say an earthquake or a flood, uh, those roads get damaged and they become impassable. And emergency services who only have regular cars and sometimes, you know, of course, air- area vehicles, but we'll focus on cars, they only have wheels to get there. Now, here we go. The vehicle named Elevate combines tech from electric cars and quadruped robots, much like uh, Boston Dynamics Spot Mini, where if you think of you know the dog-like robot, uh, yeah, same concept, except the wheels would kind of uh, you know, consider the wheels the feet and the legs would kind of be your suspension system, they would spider out and this thing walks like, uh, you know, like anything else where, you know, according to this picture here and according to the article, uh, it will be able to, uh, you know, kind of push its wheels down and walk on them like flat feet. They said that it can adopt either a reptilian or mammalian gait and leap across a five foot gap. And that's not something you could say of a typical 4x4. They even have some more concept art here of it climbing a mountain. Let's say, you know, uh, let's say a hiker and it needs to climb up a hill. Uh, The vehicle would be able to do that as well. Uh, Saying that um, it can be driven autonomously. It could improve the lives of wheelchair users without access to a stair ramp where, hey, you know, I guess if you can't... uh, I guess you can't wheelchair up, uh, you know, up a surface. You can, of course, hey, uh, drive your car up there. I'm kidding. They obviously mean that the the technology would then be used for uh, uh, wheelchairs, where you know a wheelchair's wheels would then be able to pop out and walk up stairs. Uh, yeah. So I I found that one weird. Uh, of all companies for Hyundai to come out and say, hey, we have a walking car and it's for emergency situations, pretty different. It really showed that the innovation wasn't just in monitors or computers, but also in cars. Because really, sometimes you don't think about CES as a place for uh, car shows, but yeah, trust me, uh, ha- like I would say, about a quarter to a half of the main show floor at CES, like the central hall, is dedicated to car companies. It's um, it's really a big deal. 
So with that being said, let's see, let's see, let's see. So looking at some of these other ones, uh, like, all right, so uh, let me just run through some of these articles that like I'm kind of passing over or opting not to do. Like the first one, Sonos, they make uh, great speakers. They have finally showed the Google Assistant working on its speakers out at CES. Definitely cool. Uh, Sonos to be able to come out with a third-party speaker for the Google Assistant. That's great. Love to hear it. Uh, I don't know, just maybe not the top of top of the list. Uh, let's see. They have, uh, let's see. Sony introduces a wireless turntable for vinyl records. So vinyl records still, you know, still on the upswing. People still like them. Retro is in. And so for your retro, uh, loving, uh, loved one, then you get a wireless turntable that can then play, read, and, uh, you know, hey, just act as a turntable without any wires, cords, and be... I don't want to say portable because obviously a turntable is not the most portable object or even music format there is, but Sony is at least helping you where you don't have even a power cord. It's rechargeable. It can play with speakers and you're good to go. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. So there's also Razer uh, came out with some peripherals, including a an Xbox One keyboard and mouse. That's a very important uh that's a very important innovation when it comes to Xbox because console, one of its primary, uh, one of console's primary drawbacks when it comes to um, P- versus PC gaming is just a mouse and keyboard are a much more accurate, immediate, and just much more responsive interface. And to give the Xbox a keyboard and mouse, which at one point was uh, I don't say like illegal, but against like the terms of service. So, like if you were caught using an adapter to use a keyboard and mouse on a console, you could actually be banned from online services or video games because that was seen as an unfair advantage. Now Xbox has officially, you know, kind of thrown up their hands and said, all right, there's enough demand for this uh, keyboard and mouse for everyone featuring Razer. So pretty darn cool. Okay. Let's go ahead and do some of these. Actually, uh, all right, so one more compilation and then we will uh, switch over to news in whatever kind of time that we have left. I don't know how much we will. But I found this compilation one pretty cool because CES, it's a big trade show. And where you have your Intel showing off 10 nanometer processors, AMD showing off your seven nanometer GPUs, you have car companies showing off their their you know their autonomy, you have Nvidia making deals to make AI you know even stronger. You have all these things that are you know kind of slam dunks for uh, you know cool, cool, innovative, and everyone and everyone out there is going to be like good. Continue with you know stay the course. But CES actually has a lot of people displaying. I think it's somewhere uh, in the neighborhood of like 100,000 companies or something. Like that. There's a lot of different companies and a lot of them, a lot of them are startups. They're first time, uh, you know, they're first time companies that figure CES is a, you know, is the best place to get some traction, to get some early interest, to get the media all in their face and try to get some attention. And that leads to sometimes some misses. And that's why we have this article here from Tech Radar. I found it pretty cool because as whenever there's an innovation in technology that's obvious, there are weird things that happen at CES and those are just as fun. So here we go. Uh, they say, let's see. So let's see, let's see. Uh, the first one is, of course, uh, the LG Series OLED TVR. That was the rollable TV. We're not going to go over that. But again, these are the weirge- weirdest gadgets out at CES. So that one's obvious. The first weird one is the rollable TV or the TV with a rollable screen. The second one on this list is a robot called Lava. There you go. It's a cuddly robot from Japanese robotics startup Groove X. Has one mission in life. And that's to make you happy. And you can see a picture of it here. There's two of them. They're kind of uh, cartoon character-esque. If you know the video game Pikmin, uh, these little roving autonomous uh, devices that just roll around your home and make you smile. 
They said, designed to behave just like a real living thing, Lava has made, uh, was made to nurture people's capacity to love. Hey, a robot that loves. Who, who knew? And by demanding the affection of its owner, and with its big cartoon eyes and teddy bear soft exterior, the, uh, it's bound to make even the iciest of hearts melt just a little. Uh, just a little. And when Lava wants to be picked up and cuddled, it waves its little arms in the air and will even follow you around your home on its wheels. It can even fall asleep in your arms and give you a good enough cuddle. Yes, we have designed cuddling robots. If you thought robots were simply these cold-hearted, eventually human-dominating machines, no, you know, hey, they'll give you a hug. They said that uh, with loads of innovative tech packed beneath its fuzzy exterior, it certainly doesn't come cheap where a pair of the bots, because you need two, uh, can work out to about $5,500. Very, very weird. And again, hey, this is tech that uh, is weird. So the next one, and this one, I say weird, but I kind of want it. The Foldimate. Yep, it folds clothes. Where there's no doubt about it, doing laundry household chores is a drag. However, the Foldimate laundry folder wants to change this, saying that all you have to do is manually insert an item of clothing into the Foldimate, and about five seconds later, the machine spits them out perfectly folded and ready to put away. Where the company estimates that the machine can go through a whole load of laundry in around five minutes. However, the convenience comes at a price, and Foldmate is no exception. That's right, about a thousand dollars, and you don't even have to learn how to fold a shirt because folding T-shirts is really hard. But the Foldmate shown off at CES. Who knew? Uh, let's see. So the next one here, and you know, this article is probably going to take us right through. But uh, I want to mention offhandedly a couple more. But the MUI. So I'm going to say Moi Smart Display, where it's one of the coolest gadgets we saw at CES 2019, and it was a plank of wood. And, of course, they're not joking. Yes, it. if you're watching the video portion, it looks like a piece of wood, a, you know, lumber, 2 by 4 And shaped like a simple wooden plank, the Moi, Moi? Movie. Smart display houses a touch-sensitive interface on the surface of the wood, allowing it to display visual data outputs and touch control functions like a thermostat, clock, weather information, dimmer controls for your lights, text-based messages or slogans, and even a way to access your voicemail. That's right. This piece of wood is actually a touch screen display. Pretty cool. Uh, costs about a thousand bucks if you want to get one. Kickstarter, uh, Kickstarter campaign, and overall, I gotta agree. That's uh, finally hipsters have a way to control all of their gadgets. So, last one, last one of the article, and again, the article tech radar. Uh, Kohler Numi 2.0 intelligent toilet. Toilet technology is awesome. It's so basic it's so uh rudimentary that you know water come in water go out and you are happy that it's no longer in your home but tech toilet technology has gone leaps and bounds and although i don't think they're you know they're kind of demonstrating it on the show floor this one looks interesting saying that if toilets could talk what would they say hopefully well luckily they can't whether you want to know the answer to the question or not the new 2.0 intelligent toilet from kohler does just that with high quality speakers that allow you to converse with Amazon Alexa as you, well, go to the bathroom. And the super smart toilet also allows you to activate the heated seat, a personal dryer, and even that's real, that's a real personal dryer. <laughs> okay, and even ambient lighting and music to set the mood for your trip because you know, pooping should not just be an activity. It should be an experience. There you go. So for this luxurious lavatory, you'll need a hefty $7,000. I'm sorry, I whispered that. I couldn't even say that out loud. $7,000. Yeah. For that money, we think you might just stick to your less talkative toilet after all. 
So again, that was a list from uh, from CES 2019, or uh, I'm sorry, from Tech Radar concerning CES 2019. And trust me, these five gadgets don't even begin to touch the amount of uh, companies being displayed out there, and sometimes the weird, weird, weird things that uh, you know that happen out there. And so, with that being said, music in the background. Some of the articles that we did not get to might touch on them tomorrow, but. Um, you know, yeah, we'll save them for then. So everyone, thank you so much for joining us here on Computer America. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, tomorrow, CES Day 3 should be about the last day we cover CES. And then we'll start to get some of these companies on the program here talking with us about what they showed off. And uh, yeah, I guess I have to add Kohler to my list. Who knew we would uh, be talking about toilets? So... Yep, everyone, uh, thank you for tuning in. If you missed any part of today's show, check out the podcast, and you can, of course, check it out there. Everyone everyone in the chat room, everyone else out there, podcast, anywhere, uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for uh, sharing with us our experience. And, uh, yeah, catch us here Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern. Everyone, have a great day. <laughs>